Okay, hello everyone. I just thought that I give you some feedback um, because I've been marking a lot of um, uh, some questions and I've also seen some other examiners mark your papers. And I just wanted to give you feedback on things where things or places where we are uh, going wrong. So uh, let's start. So um, we see that um, a candidate here has been asked to define what a term pregnancy is. You can see that there's, uh, I've given two examples right from your papers. So we can see that someone says a term pregnancy is, is a pregnancy that has accomplished 38 weeks gestation, which allows the fetus to mature. Um, the problem with that definition is that there's nothing um, of what we want there. So we just want you to mention 37 weeks, which is where term starts, and we want to you to mention 42 weeks where term ends. So term is a period of five weeks from 37 weeks to 42 weeks. So you have to mention 37 and 42 in your answer. If those numbers are not there, you get a zero, like in the example on top there. Um, you see the bottom answer. Uh, the second candidate mentions 37 somewhere, but their second number is wrong. That's 40. Um, we know that term starts from 37 up to 42 weeks. So this um, candidate, if they are lucky, maybe they'll get one or half because they have not put in the actual numbers that, um, that we want there. That depends on who's marking and so on. So the first candidate gets zero, the second candidate maybe, maybe gets one or half because they've mentioned uh, 37 weeks. The next definition we see is um, you've been asked to define what puperal sepsis is and you can see there's an answer there, sepsis or infection um, in the puperium uh, 24 hours after delivery, up to six weeks beyond delivery. Again, they have an idea of what puperosepsis is, but the big issue about puperosepsis is that it's genital tract infection. It's not just an infection. So if you don't say genital tract infection, you get a zero. So really, this answer is a zero because uh, puperosepsis is infection of the genital tract in the puperium. So you have to take note of that. If, if you have malaria, if you have meningitis in the puperium, that's not puperosepsis. If you have septicemia in the puperium, that's not puperosepsis. You have to be specific. Genital tract infection in the puperium, that's puperosepsis. That's what uh, this question is looking for. Um, this one, I just throw it in there because <clears throat> if you're a midwife or a medical student or anyone who's ever worked in labor, you are not going to say lie and position in the same sentence that's like criminal so fetal lie should be very clear it's the longitudinal axis of the mother and how it relates to the longitudinal axis of the fetus that's what really lie is position is really the fetal presenting but so when you are asked about position think about occipital posture position um, um, and such things to remind you what you're talking about. So it's the presenting part and how it relates to the pelvis. Um, you can see somebody uh, says fetal lie. This is the position. Again, no. Fetal lie and position are totally different things. They can't be in one sentence. So we should be very careful with terminology because when you're in OBS and gain station means something. Engaged doesn't mean engaged to be married. Position can mean anything, um, but in labor word, it means one specific thing. So we need to be careful mixing up a terminology like that. Um, then we can see secondary postpartum hemorrhage. Somebody has said a lot of things. Um, I think this one needs a zero, not a one, because secondary postpartum hemorrhage, really the key there is the secondary. If this question really assumes that you know what postpartum hemorrhage is, and secondary is the issue. So we know we have primary and secondary. So primary means that um, bleeding has happened within 24 hours. 
Secondary means bleeding has happened after 24 hours. We are not really, 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 really interested uh, in the quantity of bleeding, uh, whether it was a Caesar, whether it was a vaginal delivery. Really, that's not the purpose of this question. The purpose of this question is for us to understand if you know the difference between secondary postpartum hemorrhage and primary postpartum hemorrhage because the causes of these two conditions are different. So really, that's the... That's the reason that classification is put there. It's not put there to, to know if you know the amount. When somebody says the patient has come in with secondary postpartum memory, you are really thinking what's the cause, what's the cause. Retained placenta, uh, placental tissues, maybe um, infection of the genital tract, uh, puperal uh, sepsis, for instance. Those are could be the causes, endometritis, yeah, could be the cause of secondary postpartum hemorrhage. So this is not really testing if you know it's 1,000 or 500. It's testing if you know the difference between secondary and primary postpartum hemorrhage. A classical C-section, it's sad, 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 sad. Um, we've said this. You can check out the tutorial on C-sections. We are very clear what a classical C-section is. It's you cutting in the uterus, but not in the lower segment. You cut somewhere else to access the... Um, fetus you're accessing the fetus using the upper segment because maybe there's a fibroid in the lower segment maybe there's a cancer in the lower segment maybe there are adhesions in the lower segment there's bowel there attached to the lower segment there's a blood attached to the lower segment so you're moving away from the lower segment to cut uh, the uterus in the thicker parts of the um, uterus the thicker parts of the body of the uterus because you don't have access to the lower segment or sometimes you have a transverse lie and then you feel that uh, doing a lower segment you have trouble extracting the baby so you just cut in the upper segment so again classical c-section has nothing to do with where you cut on the abdomen it has nothing to do with fenestel it has nothing to do with whatever incision you do on the abdomen it's that incision on the um, uterus please 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 let's get this basic um uh, terminology in order Gestational hypertension, again, you can see this definition, it has gaps. So these questions are all two marks each. But you see that somebody says this is increase in blood pressure after 20 weeks, which is okay. Then um, they say without proteinuria, which is okay as well. So you have hypertension that starts after 20 weeks. Uh, there's no... Um, indicators of end organ damage. Uh, like proteinuria, but you need to indicate that this hypertension should resolve after six to eight weeks. Because if it doesn't resolve, then it changes. That's That becomes a chronic hypertension now. So you have to put in the resolution of the hypertension. So there are four things there. One, that you have hypertension, at least 140 over 90. Uh, then this hypertension starts after 20 weeks um, and it's in that patient who's previously normotensive and then there's no end organ damage then the last uh, parameter is that it resolves after um, six to eight weeks so we see that this um, definition doesn't have all those criteria and i think this candidate is lucky to get all the Okay, guys, so the um, next thing is um, fetus. When you're asked to define a word like fetus, the important thing is you're knowing what an embryo is, knowing what a morula is, knowing what a zygote is, knowing what a baby is, knowing what a neonate is. Don't mix up the words. Don't say baby where you're supposed to say fetus. Don't say embryo where you're supposed to say fetus. So fetus starts at eight to ten weeks if you are saying eight weeks it's from date of conception if you are saying ten weeks it's from it's from the date of um, the last normal menstrual period so just uh, be careful about um, these terminologies is it a baby is it an offspring is it um, a neonate is it a fetus is it an embryo that's really really important don't um, mix those things up Um, it's sad that we are talking about parity.
Um, the reason I put this slide there is just to show you that when you talk about parity, don't talk about children. Parity has nothing to do with children. It has something to do with pregnancies. So the number of pregnancies that a woman has had beyond fetal viability is parity. The number of pregnancies, not the number of children beyond fetal viability. And not whether the children are alive or dead. It's not the children. It's regardless of outcome. When you say children, you are talking about other things now. So remove children from your definition of parity. It has nothing to do with children. So this candidate, I think, got a zero there. I don't know if that's a question mark or it's a one. Yeah, because of that, because you're saying children when parity doesn't have anything to do with children. Then there's this one. This one is a bit tricky. It's indirect maternal death. So we've talked about indirect maternal death. You can look up the, um, um, the presentation on maternal death uh, basics. And the um, issue with this definition, you can see they say that death of a mother as a result of complications unrelated to pregnancy. So what this candidate has defined here is... Um, is an accidental or incidental maternal death, really. This is an, an incidental maternal death because the woman has died from some condition, but that condition is not related in any way to pregnancy. That's a good definition of um, an incidental maternal death. But what we want here is to, for you to define an indirect maternal death. So an indirect maternal death means that whatever condition the woman died from was worsened by the pregnancy. So it can be heart disease, it can be anemia, it can be malaria, it can be anything. The point there is that whatever condition it was, was worsened by the physiological changes of pregnancy or by the management of the pregnancy, or both. So that's really what an indirect maternal death. I see that lots of you are having problems trying to define. I can see from the examples that you know what an indirect maternal death is. But the issue is that this indirect maternal death is from this cause, whatever the cause is, that doesn't matter. The point is that pregnancy worsened, the physiological changes of pregnancy worsened that particular condition, or the management of the pregnancy got in the way of the management of that condition, then that becomes an indirect maternal death. And safe abortion, Really, from this, you can read what these candidates say. They are saying all sorts of things. The important thing is that unsafe abortion is about where did the termination of pregnancy take place? Was it in a hospital setup? Then second, who did it? Was it a qualified medical personnel? If you have those two issues, then that termination of pregnancy or abortion was safe, regardless of the outcome. So that's really the two uh, things that we look out for when you get this question of unsafe abortion. It's where it was done. Was it in a hospital setup? Then secondly, who did it? Are they well-trained uh, medical personnel? Then what you have there is a safe abortion or safe termination of pregnancy. Of course, when you say uh, using cassava sticks and so on, all that is unsafe because it's not done by a trained personnel and it's not done in a hospital setup. Okay, and this is the last one. Um, so radical hysterectomy is removal of the uterus, removal of adjacent structures, and um, sometimes removal of uh, part of the vagina as well. That's what radical hysterectomy is. You haven't just removed the uterus by itself, which is what is called a simple hysterectomy, but you've gone beyond... Um, just removing the uterus. You removed adjacent supporting structures of the uterus. You've removed part of the vagina. And uh, usually the ovaries and the fallopian tubes are removed as well. But I see that some of you think that a radical hysterectomy is when the uterus is removed and the ovaries and fallopian tubes are removed. That's what a lot of answers are saying. But we need to be um, aware that radical hysterectomy means removing the uterus uh, adjacent structures, supporting structures, 
a part of the vagina um, and so on and usually the ovaries and fallopian tubes are also are also removed so that's what i've observed i think this is the last slide thank you for listening and we'll see you in the next uh, presentation